And I did not go in on D-Day, but we went in in July after Normandy, and my first action was in uh, St. Nazaire, Lorient, which were submarine uh, bases for the Germans uh, attacking, the U-boats were attacking out of there, going into the North Sea. We managed to close them up and seal them in, and had a very pleasant war there for a while because it wasn't a great deal of action, but a little later on we ended up up near the first done and then on to the Battle of the Balls where I finally uh, had my final wound. What was the Battle of the Balls like when you were leading the charge? The Battle of the Balls, if history proves correct, was the largest battle in the history of the world. It was Hitler's last thrust, gathered all the forces he had together and much to the surprise of a great many of our divisions which were in the area thinking it was just a matter of a, a static war he gathered for one last opportunity to try to drive the American and British and Canadian forces back into the sea Allied forces and uh, it was a fantastically large battle, very bloody, and I'm sure many of you listening to me now have seen many, many movies made about the Battle of the Bulge. But there were some horrendous things that took place up there, the massacre at Malmody when they lined up a group of our boys and shot them down in the middle of a cult, uh, uh, of a uh, snow field up there. and. Uh, there were some horrible things that took place in the Battle of the Bulls. It was a huge battle with a lot of wounded. I would venture to guess that most of the wounds, the serious wounds that came out of our invasion of Europe was at the Battle of the Bulls. Why did you lead the charge? Pardon? Why did you, why were you the lead man going out for your oh, battalion? Oh, I, I was a platoon sergeant. And uh, Company C of, the, my, my, of my regiment was the leading company in the, to the final attack that I was in. <clears throat> and I carried a, strangely enough, a 30 caliber machine gun with a belt around my neck, which is very foolish. It's known as an A6 machine gun with a bipod. And I was not, that was not the weapon I was armed with, but that's the one I carried in an attack where we were attacking pillboxes in the old original Siegfried Line, which was, was a famous old battle line in World War I, where the Germans were still using those same pillboxes in our war, World War II, that they used then, and we were dislodging them and blowing them out of those pillboxes, and I was in one of those attacks. That was my last attack, it was on uh, two or three pillboxes in the old Siegfried Line in Germany. Near a little town of Tettingen, Germany, is where they uh, took me to for uh, my, was my front aid station, where they uh, amputated my foot in uh, front aid station there in Tettingen. And then I was flown, luckily, back to 48th General Hospital in Paris, and then I was evacuated back by plane to uh, Bowling Field in Washington, and then to Walter Reed, where I spent the next 10 months. 10 to 11 months. How has the government taken care of you all these years with your war Absolutely. Wound? I have no complaints whatsoever. Uh, I have been very fortunate. Uh, I uh, had nothing but a good time with my leg. I walk well, dance, play golf, uh, engage in everything. But now I'm one of the fortunate ones. I, I was fortunate enough to have my knee and of course, some of the boys lost their knees, they're not quite as agile. But I didn't break stride. I went back and finished up my degrees and things after the war. And I had a very active physical life all of my life. Very happily married, two wonderful children. And uh, uh, in general, I've enjoyed a great and wonderful life. And with the support and help of my family, friends, and hometown people, when I came back from the war, I was fortunate enough to uh, return to college, and and uh, was very. They were very supportive. My fraternity brothers and my 
of the secret society there, they were very supportive. And I and no one could have a had a better life than I've had. And as I say, this is what I tell some of the amputees I talk to from time to time that are engaged in this so called war. And I say that with tongue in cheek of course. But uh, that's the message I try to get across to them and I'm 83 years of age, or approaching that age, and and it's good for them to see me and others like me. And there are many others like me, you know, although we're a vanishing breed. That every opportunity we get, uh, we should talk to these young right kids that are and, uh, experiencing something. It's quite a shock for an 18 or 19 or 22 year old young man. Uh, Whatever he may be, it's a shock to lose a limb, but life will go on. As a matter of fact, I don't think anyone could have had more fun and enjoyed life more than I have. So your leg works just fine for you? What do you call the other one? Late for dinner. Oh, gee. No. No, see, the, I don't know what I call the other one. The, but the, the one the government gave me, I'm very fond of, and I've had several. As a matter of fact, I have a new one on right now that uh, costs you tax taxpayers sixty-five hundred dollars, and I'm very grateful to all of you for paying your taxes. And the other one is the one that your mother gave you. And the mother gave me the other leg. That's going along very nicely too. Thank you. And uh, there are other members of my body that are dying slowly, but everything else, as far as walking is concerned, is doing very nicely. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the interview and it was a pleasure talking with you. <laughs>